This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. So hello and welcome to the latest podcast for the IEEE Requirements column. I, today it's Neil Maiden here, I'm the editor of the column. And today I'm talking to Ellen Gottesdiener and Mary Gorman about their recent work on agile processes and practices and how they may, might relate to requirements practice. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Ellen and Mary to introduce themselves. Ellen, how about you first? Great. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, this is Ellen Gottesdiener, and I'm the uh, president and uh, principal cons consultant at EBG Consulting. And what we do is work with product uh, and development teams to help them discover and deliver products that their customers value. Um, I myself have been in the, quote, requirements and business analysis space. And what we've been doing a lot the last uh, seven or plus years, actually, is um, working with product teams, particularly those that are transitioning or have transitioned to agile and lean practices. So they're building high-tech products, and our values are around collaboration, how to do that planning and analysis really well. Mary? Well, I am the Vice President of Quality and Design at EBG Consulting, and um, I've got a background in analysis, uh, design, started out as a programmer many years ago. Um, Ellen and I have also been very involved with the IIBA, and uh, I participated as a team lead in developing uh, 1.6 and 2.0. Of the BAC. Of the Body BA. of Knowledge, yes, the BA Body of Knowledge. Thank you very much, Ellen and Mary. So I'm sitting here in London staring at a beautiful new book that I read over the weekend called Discover to Deliver, Agile Product Planning and Analysis. that has your name on it. Suggests you've been interested in agile practices for some time. In your experiences, how has agile changed the way in which we companies, consultants are doing requirements work? Well, um, this is Ellen, and, and maybe I'll start, and then Mary will, will kick in a little bit. What we've been finding is that actually agile practices end up amplifying the best of requirements practices. We're, we're working in a very compressed time frame, and uh, we have to learn really quickly. And a lot of the requirements work in general, whether you're doing agile or not, is about trying to learn what you don't know, you know, exposing your ignorance about the product you need to build. And um, as opposed to traditional practices where we were dealing with a large quantity of potential requirements that we would baseline, what we're doing on our Agile teams is working in very small batches and um, making sure that we're building the right thing. So, Another really important and useful um, practice, I think, with Agile requirements is that verification and validation end up really becoming collapsed uh, in the time frame of, for what we're doing. Mary, you want to add something to that? Uh, sure. The idea that we actually are doing, in many cases, more analysis, but in a very compressed time frame. So the focus is not on writing detailed specifications, as Ellen indicated, for some large bunch of requirements. And we really find that focusing on value and what our ability to be able to define what value is in very clear, transparent terms um, is absolutely essential to be able to select those highest values and quickly deliver them. You don't really know what 
what you ha- what you're going to build <laughs> and you have to have uh a tolerance for that ambiguity and be purposeful in your planning for uncertainty you know um and the, the one of the things that that really is different we were working with a client a couple of years ago and um helping them with the practices we described in the book and we helped them derive a very thin slice requirement in the form in this case of a story and the traditional let's call him the traditional project manager and he was transitioning to agile said well that's a very trivial that's what good is that that's nothing useful and the product manager who was basically the product champion or in scrum terms the product owner cut him off immediately and said are you kidding this would be really really useful if you could build this slice in a couple of weeks and we can get feedback from the client and they were building a commercial software product and needed to tune and calibrate exactly what they were going to build so that continual um deliver and feedback cycle is really different um that that you're you know you're really exploring building and getting feedback as quickly as possible so ellen i also remember in that situation where the value wasn't just on the what we might call the functional requirements it was also trying to find uh the risk involved with some of the non-functional so the value in trying to control that risk recognizing that risk early on i think that's really another way that it's changed our requirements practices mm, definitely So at the beginning of your your answer there you talked about amplification of good requirements practices is that the discover uh cycle that you talked about in your answer just now is that the amplified good practice or is it one of the amplified good practices It's one it's one of them I mean discovery is about learning eliciting analyzing valuing and even planning it's all of that um when when we think about you know requirements engineering practices business analysis practices that are valuable we think about solving the right problem in the first place or finding the right opportunity in the first place and um the you know the big v of verification and validation uh we want to verify to make sure we're building it correctly as quickly as possible and use practices that are concrete uh and um test our understanding and at the same time rather than waiting for months or years to validate that we built it correctly we need to do that get that feedback that validation as quickly as possible sort of like the uh, you know the idea of validated learning that's very popular and and known in the the lean startup community. Okay. Um you often read in the literature there are also some downsides to more agile requirements practices. Are there any that you've identified in your experiences in with many agile requirements projects? Well, this actually uh could lead to us talking about the big concepts in our book and it really does touch on those points, Neil. So one of the okay. things that we find um the p- concept of a partnership. So we talk about stakeholders and many times during analysis what happens is we're not necessarily engaging the appropriate mix of people. So this is a challenge. Um it's always been the case but I think in agile it becomes and to use that word again it amplifies the omission of certain players so we believe that we need to in agile analysis get the right people involved at the right time and that includes this diverse group of people that are going to be able to collaborate and we see that as three different um perspectives there's the customer folks who have a stakehold in the business in the product itself um there's certainly the business people whether it's uh, a product services person or a subject matter expert or the sponsor who's paying for it and then also there most importantly we're finding the omission is often the technology folks the developers and the technical advisors are not brought in early enough in our analysis conversations so trying to make sure that these representatives from these three groups 
understand um, their particular perspectives and join together. They're jointly responsible for, as Ellen said, to be able to elicit and to be able to specify what those requirements are. Ellen, do you want to add anything about the partnership? Um, well, I just say that you know we need all of those three partners, the business, customer, and technology, to, to really make sure we have a product that's useful and usable and feasible and also strategically aligned. You know, they, they really do have to act as, as, as product partners. And have um, another thing, which really goes back to just good collaboration, is to have very transparent decision making. This value is in the eyes of the beholder. So when we start having conversations including value, well, that starts to change things because it's not always just about money. Um, there's different partners like customers may value convenience and, and uh, um, the use, usability of the product and, <clears throat> and the business people, of course, may value certainly return on investment but also things like reputation and differentiation and so forth. That starts right away really engaging people in, in, in conversations you know, when they have the value. Um, I remember working with a team uh, last summer and uh, they were building a scientific application and, and very complex product. And they were actually, you know, they had a vision that was fairly decent, but they were actually not too clear on that value stuff. And um, using, you know, a collaboration uh, workshop, a collaborative workshop, we got all these partners together and they started, I had them in small teams coming up with value considerations that they had by their partnership point of view. And, um, and then they shared all that and then the uh, ultimate product champion was able to come up with his short list collapsing and combining. And what they were able to do is for the next three months in the release they were working on, just use those value, that list of values that combine the three partners for all the upcoming work that they had. So that's one really powerful way. And maybe Mary, you could talk about the, the product dimensions because we found that to be also really powerful. Sure, so to engage these folks, and it's really sort of leveling the playing field and enabling all of these folks to equally participate. So the thing that we've done is to chunk what we might traditionally call functional and non-functional requirements. And so coming up with what we call dimensions. So every product we believe has at least seven product dimensions. And we're talking about those dimensions we consider when we are building a software product, for example, or some sort of a device. And the functional dimensions would include the user who would actually use the product, uh, the actions that they could initiate and what the system would produce for actions. Uh, another dimension is the data. And uh, the fourth functional dimension is what we call control, which represents those business policies, business rules that need to be enforced by the product. So most times business folks are familiar with who the users are, what actions and data in control. Um, they may not have been able to think of them from an optioning perspective. So we like to use the ability to explore what those user options would be and as Ellen said, be able to use the value considerations to prioritize those or value those different options. So the business folks are, as I said, pretty typically comfortable with those, but the other three dimensions are also equally important. And those are what interfaces are necessary, um, the product has with uh, users and other systems. Uh, the sixth dimension is around the environment, where the product is actually used, as well as where it's actu how it's actually developed. And then the seventh dimension of the quality attributes uh, often called the illities, and we want to think about what might be security, performance, availability, reuse, those sorts of things. So uh, recapping the seven dimensions, when we have conversations about a product, we're expecting all um, partners to be able to express what their needs are of those dimensions, as well as to participate in making value decisions.
And do you find that your stakeholders find these seven dimensions natural to work with? They're comfortable with them? They can articulate their needs in terms of those dimensions? Well, that's a great question, Neil. And what often happens is initially the technology folks are not as comfortable with what might be called the four functional dimensions. And conversely, the business isn't always comfortable with the non-functional. But with um, ways to engage them, they ideally are equal partners in exploring those particular needs and making decisions. Uh, we had a One situation. Other. Go ahead, Ellen. Yeah, maybe I was just gonna, I was going to say in terms of what we do, and then Mary can tell tell a little bit more about some of our experiences. But what we actually do when we do this work is that each of the seven dimensions that we've developed over the years in working with agile teams is a visual symbol that uh, represents that dimension. And then, you know, as we put in the book, also just a, a lot of quick description. And there's a set of questions that we would ask about those. But we put them on the wall. So we rely heavily on wall work and the visual elements. So it's like a visual language. And we'll line up the seven dimensions, the, the symbols for them, and uh, facilitate conversations. And we call these structured conversations across these seven dimensions. So we'll have groups of people in small groups standing at the wall working at the different dimensions and being you know, literally walking the wall and being able to have conversations about options across the dimension. And what's really cool about this is, is that it's really the best of requirements work, which is learning. There's a lot of learning and conversation that's very rich but efficient. It's, it's pretty quick. Mary, you were going to tell a tell a client uh, example of this. Well, absolutely. What happened um, is this one team that we were working with felt they had traveling stories. You know that expression where they couldn't complete a story and so it traveled to the next iteration. So their way of dealing with that was just to make the iterations longer, <laughs> but that didn't quite work. Mm. So <laughs> what uh, what the issue was really was around scope. And when they took their stories and they, uh, Ellen, we also want to make clear, we use color um, to, for each one of the dimensions, we use a different color. So we took their story and we color coded it and we found out they were really only focused on two dimensions. Uh, who was the user and what were the actions? So what that led to was the devil was in the other dimensions, um, but just they hadn't focused on them. So we found out one of the reasons their stories were traveling was because they hadn't clearly identified the different interfaces, and the connectivity for those interfaces was not clearly defined. Uh, the data dimension, it turns out they had over 4,000 attributes, and they were just wallowing in attributes, which attributes would be included, which were high value. And then, of course, to support the actions and the data, they had lots and lots of business rules. And they were actually quite complex. Uh, yet what they recognized is they really didn't know how to write testable business rules. And they were finding that out when they were getting in development, which was pretty late. Um, the environment that they were developing in was brand new to the team. So that was challenging. And the quality attributes were really sort of lost. So when we stood back and looked at the original user story and looked at just two of those dimensions, it was clear why they couldn't get um, a clear boundary or clear margins around that story. There were just so many other things that hadn't been explored. So using this visualization, as Ellen described, um, when they were putting these options on the walls, they found these big holes. They were whole columns in the walls around these five dimensions that they hadn't even addressed. Yeah, I love your term, wall work. I think the wall is one of the most underutilized requirements tools. I mean, we really <laughs> sort of stress that to people. Um, one of the things I was fascinated by in, in your book was this notion of the structured conversation, which again, at one level could be very simple, but it's also a very powerful and rich approach to requirements work. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the structured conversation, how it works, and uh, why you developed it? Sure. Um, really, it's just a very lightweight framework. 
and it provides that structure, if you will, for the team to use in their collaborative discussions. And it really um, has been a way for a team to organize those conversations. The goal really is to help them dig as deep as they need for whatever planning view they're at um, to get into those options for the seven dimensions. So it starts by exploring options. And they'll pick and choose which of the seven product dimensions to start with. If they're a data-rich project, they might drop into the data dimension first. Or they might have a situation where they are in a regulatory um, environment and there's a change to regula regulation, so they might start with a control dimension. So regardless of which a dimension they start with, um, they have to have that big picture view. They obviously want to have their values, their vision, their goals and objectives. And with that in mind, they will then take each one of those product dimensions and explore the options. And by exploring, we're talking about discovering, um, being able to elicit what those options are. They'll list the options, and then using the value considerations, um, they'll have to identify which of those options would be the higher value for that particular time frame. And that sounds pretty cut and dry, but what adds to the mix is often dependencies and risks. So it, it's a very thoughtful consideration to select the appropriate high value options for each dimension, and then looking across those seven dimensions making sure that they're a cohesive set. Uh, often when that set of seven dimensions is identified, it can be written whether it's a story, if you're at, the, at a release view. It may be we use these seven dimensions in the structured conversation even at what we call the big view or strategic planning. And at that point, you might package them into features. So, Obviously, the closer we get to delivery, the more detailed these options are, the more granular they are. And so just to recap, we have explore options in the structured conversation, um, evaluate the options, and the third part is to confirm. Um, do we really understand what we've put together? And what we found is very helpful is to have examples that people can specify um, very concrete examples. We might also use acceptance criteria such as given when then, um, specifying acceptance criteria. So basically, what we're looking for is this three parts to the structured conversation. We have to explore options, evaluate options, and then confirm um, that particular set of options. Neil was asking why we developed it, and it sort of came came about organically, I think, this explore, evaluate, confirm, explore, evaluate, confirm uh, conversation. You know, it, requirements in the Agile world is more than just stories. You know, you don't <laughs> just writing a bunch of user stories and throwing them up on the wall doesn't doesn't obtain the shared understanding and the decisions, the tough decisions a team has to make to deliver something valuable quickly. So when we combine this explore, evaluate, confirm with optioning across the seven dimensions, what happens is that, and, and we have the partners doing this, right? People are now sharing their diverse perspectives uh, and being very transparent. Um, it, it ends up, ironically, even though it sounds like, okay, you have to do these three things, and you're looking at the <clears throat> seven dimensions, it actually is extremely fast and efficient. And once a team starts using this and they're working at the wall, you know, they're able to point or uh, one of the things we like to do is have the ultimate decision maker, which is usually the product champion, our pr preferred term as opposed to product owner. We'll give that person a, a marker and have them circle or star the options, say in which actions are the high value um, ones for the next delivery cycle. So now all of a sudden everybody is engaged in the conversation. The decision making is transparent. They're thinking of things that they didn't necessarily think of before and also challenging each other. I mean, we saw this recently in a, an environment with, with the company that builds commercial 
products for, let's say, for the healthcare uh, field, and um, they were trying to figure out what they were going to deliver in their next release of the product around a set of medical conditions. And by looking at some of the options on the wall for data, let's say that was one of the uh, set of medical conditions, and then glancing over under the user dimension where there was actually a persona that they had, you know, we had actually a persona on a page that we developed very quickly in this work session. Um, they were able to say, well, this person really would be more uh, concerned about this medical condition and then glance at the value criteria for, say, a medical director and what would be important for them and make decisions pretty quickly about what was the most important thing and all get on the same page. So part of why you, this organically came about was because we recognized that all the stakeholders need to get engaged, this partnership, business, customer, technology. And, you know, having done workshops for many, 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 many years, you know, the first book I wrote was Requirements by Collaboration about doing workshops. One of the patterns of things that, that I kept noticing and learning from, you know, standing on the shoulders of other great facilitators was that you have to get all the perspectives out there. You have to open up. And that's what that explore step is about before you can close. Um, and get diverse thinking before the narrowing happens. Mary, what, what would you like to add? Well, what I've found is, um, having been an analyst for quite a long time, we used to rely principally on analysis models. And Ellen and I love models. We think they play a very important role. But many times the models, um, from an agile perspective, don't allow us to do optioning. So we want to make sure we explore options, value them, and, and often limit the analysis models to high value. Um, in other cases, I'm sort of talking about both sides of my mouth here, other times we may use models to explore and then pause because the model is not usually the deliverable by itself. It can supplement our understanding. So what I think is one of the key benefits um, that we've been focusing on is in, in providing what we call focus questions for each dimension. Those questions are answered by learning what the options are and possibly supplementing that exploring uh, with lightweight models. So it really, in my experience, it sort of shifted my focus as an analyst from doing modeling as the majority of my job to blend that with the optioning. So a facilitated session would start with optioning as well as adding in the models. And that's, the, for me personally, that was a change. Yeah, this, this, this focus on optioning is, it seems to be something that's often overlooked in early requirements work, that it's all about decision making. You're trying to make mm -hmm. decisions about scoping, about direction, about priorities. And our, our obsession with modeling it almost impedes, it almost hides that need to, mm -hmm. to make decisions early. Is that mm -hmm. something that you found? Well, modeling can be a slippery slope. People get into it. And uh, I was working with a group, and the data model became this just, um, it, it was like a gorilla in the room, and everyone had to keep feeding the gorilla. Um, <laughs> when we really needed to step back and recognize that we were, modeling a lot of data that was not high value. And so that, that was an interesting experience for the group. So one of the interesting features of the book is this focus on adapting your practices, tweaking, changing, adapting your practices as you go. Um, I was wondering on what do you think are two of the three most important aspects of this adaptation and why do we need to adapt um, so frequently in our requirements work? Hmm. That's a great, a great question. I mean, uh, you, you're always adapting to the, to the product and the product domain, to the team and the culture, uh, and uh, what the imperatives are for the project in terms of delivering value. What, what specifically the types of practices that we recommend adapting that we talk about in the book, Discover to Deliver, are adapting your structured conversation, um, 
adapting these practices for your delivery method because we have found these to be very powerful on uh, different delivery methods, whether you're talking about a time box or a flow uh, or even a traditional waterfall. Uh, adapting how you go about your acquisition or integration of COTS, you know, commercial off-the-shelf software, as well as adapting documentation and uh, for regulated environments. So um, those are some of the things that we focus on in, in the book. But you have to adapt. You, there's not enough time, and there's too much waste if you don't adapt. We know that handovers don't work. And you know, products are complex. They're expensive to build and maintain. Customers are increasingly more savvy and demanding about the products that they have. Uh, requirements risks don't go away. Uh, I mean, a really wonderful part of Agile is that it accelerates your uh, ability to see what the risks are quickly, but still those requirements risks continue to be the most d difficult, insidious problems that we have in any kind of high-tech development product. And you have to adapt because, of course, we, the most complex thing of all is us people. <laughs> we are complex uh, very complex systems ourselves. So those are some of the reasons why we found you know, that we have to adapt. Um, and some of the things that you might consider adapting is, well, first of all, you have to know we haven't talked much about the planning aspect, which we do cover, uh, discuss in the book, but there's different planning horizons. And the structure conversation and the seven dimensions all work uh, regardless of what your planning horizon is, whether it's really immediate, like an iteration, a couple of weeks, or even a day, or a release, which might be a month, number of weeks, or even the whole roadmap for the product. We call those the, the now view, the big view, the now view, the preview, and the big view, respectively. Um, so you have to know what time horizon that you're doing this work around for one thing. And then you have to pick, well, which dimension is a good one to start with? And the cool thing is, because you have seven to navigate across, is that if one doesn't give you, get people going and give you enough um, oomph for energy, you can just switch to another one. But it's useful to have an idea based on the domain. For example, if it's a very data-rich domain like Mary was talking about, you might start with the data dimension. Or if people... Uh, uh, if it's very um, uh, sorry, process oriented, where action uh, makes sense, you might start with that, uh, and so forth. So, so that's another thing that you want to adapt, and that helps when you think about that a little bit before you start the conversation. It helps accelerate the conversation and get going quickly. Um, and you also want to adapt which tools that that you're going to use. M Mary, you want to add something to that in terms of adapting? Oh yeah, the the one that um, we're hitting on quite often with our clients is the need to um, integrate, configure uh, commercial software, and this has been so challenging. Uh, we had a situation recently where one of our clients had purchased a vendor package, and um, the entire team had the client team had spent months trying to figure out how could they get inside this box, if you will, and trying to determine what they needed to configure for this product. Now, they are a uh, global company. They had to deal with um, their employees in different countries being able to use this product, different languages. And basically, the vendor had given them a sandbox and said, go explore the product and tell us what you want changed. So they had a number of people just pounding away and trying to make notes about what what would they want out of this product, how would they configure it. So that wasn't working too well. <laughs> so we went in and conducted a workshop and we used the seven dimensions. And it just really, in a less than a day, it, the lights were going on because they realized that they had to get under the covers. They had to learn about what the data details were, um, business rules. Um, the interface was not just the user interface. They had to really be very careful in exploring the interfaces for the other systems. So adapting their practice and basically coming up with um, their value options for the seven dimensions 
led to them recontracting with the vendor. Um, have taken that holistic look and being able to have an in-depth conversation about these aspects was something they had not been able to do before. So we believe that you can use these seven dimensions um, when you're acquiring and integrating the commercial software. And the really cool thing about this also was the work enabled them to quickly build the kind of acceptance criteria they were going to be using uh, when they were trying to finally engage with that product and, and have it go live. Well, I was just going to add something else that is a sort of a bugaboo that people have around Agile and requirements. And, and one of the things um, that we talk about is adapting your documentation practices. And of course, some people have the myth that you don't do any documentation when you have an Agile, <laughs> when you're doing Agile development. And one of the teams we were working with um, uh, not too long ago was in uh, had a release coming up, and they were actually using uh, open source uh, development environment for their architecture. And there was some big questions about documentation they needed to deliver for the release. And their customer base is pretty tech savvy. Um, and when we were looking at you know documentation, what we always want to do is use use that value point of view. What is the value of documentation? And so that's one of your adaptation factors. And so instead of doing this big specification and delivering that you know, with the release, they realized, you know what, all we really need because of the way the product was being used was um, a couple of pages with an architecture diagram so that these very tech savvy users could use the product. They were always familiar with, with an open source environment and with the architectures they were building on. So that was the absolute minimum that they needed. And they saved themselves a heck of a lot of time by just looking at <laughs> adapting their documentation practices. But you know, in other cases, like when you're building a medical device, uh, documentation is really high value because it's part of getting the product accepted from a regulatory point of view. And it's also useful to the product in uh, maintaining it, selling it, uh, supporting it. So it's product level documentation, which is the highest value documentation. But um, too many teams spend too much time trying to have nice, clean, beautiful documentation when it's really just for work in progress and it doesn't need to have a life beyond that. So that's another simple example of one of the things that we want to just be purposeful and mindful of when we adapt our practices. So as I was going to ask before, the, it sounds like this uh, adaptation is built into the approach rather than being left to the skill of the analyst, which is something you might characterize a lot of existing projects as relying on. Oh yes, definitely. I mean, everybody is. It, this is a you know, uh, it's a team sport, right? I think Alistair Coburn used that expression that uh, it's collaborative. So everybody together would need to figure out how we're going to adapt practices. Um, and just like uh, you know, we work with a team that was using a time boxer, in the, their case Scrum approach, and they were also at the same time pressured with having to do maintenance on the existing product while in, the, in flight they were making changes uh, to enhance it completely to, to have new features. So they adapted how they were tracking their work by combining you uh, integrating uh, Kanban into the way that they were managing their work and being able to do new development as well as enhancing the existing product. But that was something that the team together needed to do. It wasn't just like a project manager standing there and saying, okay, this is going to be our new, new process here. They needed to collaborate to co-develop it and test it and know what evidence they would have to see that this was working or not. That's fascinating. I was just wondering whether you've had examples with your clients, whether they've taken on this collaborative, jointly ad owned adaptation into their wider work ethic and approach. So it's outside of the, the development project and gone into the wider work at all. Well, it actually uh, almost um, highlights the need because um, whether it's marketing or um, ops, these other groups have to fit in with 
these practices. So it's it's sort of reaching out into those um, areas. And product management, we've seen that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like sometimes we'll uh, get involved in doing uh, workshops, collaborative workshops, and um, we like to have uh, at the end of the session a, what we just call a show and tell, where we pull in some of the key stakeholders that didn't really need to be part of the direct conversations, the structured conversations for for planning, say, a release, but pull in those stakeholders and. You know, we've had where CIO and uh, head of product management come in and say, why aren't we doing this for all our work? Uh, because they realize how powerful it is. Just get, get the story up on the wall, have people collaborate quickly, be very transparent uh, about the value criteria and the choices. So, um, you know, it depends on our engagement. Sometimes they're tactical and sometimes they're more strategic. So we always hope and look for those opportunities for the, these practices that may be just tactically on a particular product or a particular um, part of the portfolio spreading. And something as simple as a show and tell or, you know, some people call doing an agile safari where people come in and look at the walls, look at the room, sharing your retrospectives, sharing your, definitely, the demonstrations at the end of an iteration or a release, those, you know, invite the world. That's what we always encourage our clients to do. So there's transparency and you get a chance to look at and evaluate your own work and get feedback from colleagues. That's really powerful. Well, as a, an employee of a large and rather cumbersome organization in which sometimes the management decision making is a little opaque, I, I think I might be showing this book to some of my colleagues to see whether we can adapt <laughs> some of these practices locally. Um, going back to the book, one of the great things about it is towards the end it raises um, some very specific techniques and tools, very concrete techniques and tools that you can use. Are there any techniques and tools from the books that stand out for you that the listener might be want to be aware of? Oh Neil, come on. We have <laughs> that's a tough one. We wrote about forty one and uh, <laughs> we think they're all wonderful of course. But uh, seriously, I would just like to put a name on uh, the topic we've really been trying to visualize in, in our listeners' minds. It's we call it the options board. And uh, what this is, you can actually see examples on our book website, on Discover to Deliver website, um, samples of, of options boards we've used with clients. And so we found this, um, again, I'll, I'll recap. Imagine that you have a long wall, pretty long wall, and you have seven columns on that wall, one for each dimension. And the symbols for each of the dimensions is hanging up. So the user symbol is hanging up over its column and the interface symbol over its. And for each of those dimensions, the team's exploring. They're at the wall writing the options on the wall. And they may be sketching a model or two in that particular column. And the reason we recommend this so much, hopefully, um, the listeners have picked up. We find it very engaging. Uh, the team is at the wall working together, collaborating. Um, they'll find that they're writing on the wall or they oftentimes they'll walk to another column and point to something and they say, well, wait a second, we haven't discussed this or we need to shift our focus. Um, it also, I think, is a way of the team being very publicly, transparently intentional. So again, that idea that um, the ability for the group itself to own that wall and pause, shift gears, swivel, whatever you want to say about that to get a deeper understanding of a particular dimension. But very importantly, regularly stepping a few feet back and looking across those seven dimensions to look at them holistically. Um, so the optioning aspect, I do want to give a shout out to um, one of your neighbors, Neil. Um, I believe he's a neighbor. He's closer to you than us right now. But Chris Matz, who's in the UK, um, his excellent work on optioning. So again, being able to visualize this, have people feel as they own it. Alan, one of your favorites? Well, I guess, uh, yeah, so the options board is one of the 41 uh, tools and techniques that we have listed there, and it's um, you know, summarized its usefulness. 
And as Mary said, the go to discovertodeliver.com and you can see some photos of, of some real ones. One that, of course, is very dear, very dear to my heart, <laughs> is facilitated workshops. And what we have found is um, that on Agile teams that you have to collab uh, sorry, you have to calibrate how formal those workshops are, those facilitated sessions really are. Um, because sometimes you'll have, in, in many ways, the structured conversation is a form of a very lightweight, low fidelity workshop. Uh, you may just need a few minutes to prepare and think about you know, how you're going to navigate through across the dimensions. But doing the, the work collaboratively, using workshops throughout your Agile project, it's, it's not just for, for planning, but daily conversations. I think that, that that's, uh, that's one thing that I certainly have a lot of passion and energy for. Mary, I'm going to kick it back to you, girl. All right. Well, I do want to mention you're too modest, Ellen, but your um, second, first book, excuse me, Requirements by Collaboration, talks about the six P's for facilitating workshops, and we've actually included an example in the book around facilitated workshops about the purpose, the participants, principles, products, and so forth. So um, yes, it's 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 another framework that we find particularly helpful. Um, I, I would also want to mention, Neil, uh, one of the techniques um, for confirming our understanding, uh, given when then. Um, this has been really powerful both for confirming but also as a way sometimes to elicit the kinds of details we'd need, um, particularly around data and rules. So we use this um, in our structured conversation. We, we say the conversation is not over until we've confirmed um, the group's understanding. So given when then is one of our favorite techniques to help in that confirmation. Yes, for confirm. And for also when it comes to lightweight models, like Mary said, we just love analysis models. Um, I mean, one of my favorites is, is using a state diagram, a low fidelity, lightweight state diagram, and you'd use that for the data dimension. One of the things that we have found without fail is when data is important in the product, which it is in many domains, um, that using a lightweight state diagram can be useful for a couple of things. One is to, to get the context and scope of that particular delivery cycle clear, like we're only dealing with data in this state, not in these other states. So we just like would draw the diagram collaboratively and just circle the state or potentially states, plural, that we're focused on. Um, the other thing that's really fabulous about the state diagram is without fail, without fail, it always reveals missing or erroneous or unknown business rules. Um, and then, of course, it helps us find pieces of data we need to support enforcing those rules for that, again, focused on that particular delivery cycle. So that's one of my little favorite ones <laughs> when it comes to analysis models. Just one thing, I mean, the um, aspect of value and the different types of tools that, and techniques we can use, because we really do need to make sure that those product options are, are definitely aligned with value. And so whether it's a purpose alignment model or the Kino model, um, those are really important. And what we sometimes do, I'm really glad you brought up the thing about value, Mary, is with the options board, I'm not sure it might be in some of the photos that we have out on the website, but often sort of to the left of the seven dimensions, we'll have a little area that shows the list of the partners and the value um, considerations that each of those partners have. And we're actually, you know, in the actual workshops when we're having these conversations, we're referencing those all the time. People's heads are swiveling over and looking at those values so that we can make those um, we can make the decisions about the high value options very quickly by referencing those. Well, the one that stood out for me, uh, which I was surprised but delighted to find, was the inclusion of Tom Gilb's language, which oh, is yeah, normally yeah. Quite, <laughs> quite structured. It's about making requirements measurable in quite a structured way. Yeah. Many people may query the presence of something as rigorous and uh, structured as that in an agile approach. So why, why is it there? Why do you think you need it? 
Oh, my goodness. Well, darn them for thinking that you don't have rigor and structure in Agile. <laughs> I mean, that is, that is such a lousy misconception out there in many ways. I mean, really, when you think about it, you have to be a lot more disciplined, tremendously disciplined when you're doing it right. So maybe that's the misconception that if people are, you know, cowboy coding and sloppy and just throw little index cards on the wall and you're done. And that's not at all really what Agile is about. So something like Plangwidge is really beautiful for being very specific about one of the lost children of the, of the uh, dimensions, which are the quality attributes. We've seen many project teams completely misshirk, abuse, misuse thinking about quality attributes. They're really the you know a lost cousin. Um, now it, it introduces complexity in testing to to start to um, look at how you're going to verify those early on. But sometimes, depending on the product, that those um, quality attributes like performance or security and response time and even usability will make or break your product. So you better be on top of that early on. So, um, I mean, Alan, Tom developed... If I, could, if I could just interject for a second, because, Neil, this is another way that we recognize this is not... Language is just not for the technology folks to be um, defining. We have to have a partnership. The business people have to understand why they might not get the um, performance that they want. So again, language would be part of the confirmation when we're at the planning horizon of moving into development very quickly. So the ability to bring this into that structured conversation is very much, it's almost paired with a given one then. So the given one then typically might be around the functional requirements whereas the language would support it. And the other thing I just, Ellen, that we have um, recognized is many times these language uh, specifications are cross-cutting. So being clear on that um, up front is really important. Mm. And I suppose the other technique that I was surprised we haven't talked about so far, which is often associated with Agile, is, is prototyping um, in the sense of producing partial functional prototypes you know, within each um, cycle. Um, how do you use prototypes for verifying or further elaborating requirements? Well, the whole user experience aspect, we know in Agile that it often has to happen like one step ahead because of the needs to design those interfaces. So that also has to be part of the plan. Uh, we use prototypes but use them cautiously um, Sometimes the prototype can get ahead of the work, too far ahead of the work. Um, people are prototyping low value data. Um, so again, we want to use it in the right context. And be clear whether we're doing you know, a prototype on glass, so to speak, or actually using the development environment or using low fidelity prototypes, which are extremely valuable for learning and uh, discovery. Thank you. Fascinating. Well, as, uh, as Ellen and Mary said, there are 41 techniques in the book. It's called Discover to Deliver, Agile Product Planning and Analysis. And I guess my closing question to, to both of you is, why write the book in the first place? What's it about? What drove you to, to go through the effort of writing a book? We all know what effort can be involved. So what was, what was the driving force behind the need for the book? Well, part of it, I'll say a few things, and Mary, please, please add, because we both came at it um, from similar and different points of view. We kept seeing Agile teams um, in particular misunderstanding each other or missing their delivery dates or thinking that you know, they're going to just completely throw analysis out of their practice altogether. Uh, and by not being efficient and effective in their analysis, it was hurting the teams. And at the same time, there is so much powerful uh, and positive things going on on Agile teams because of the collaboration. And when you really think about it, 
requirements is the heart of all the work that we're doing. And so all these different stakeholders, the partners need to come together and to be able to explore those requirements collaboratively, that stuff is more important than other uh, than ever, I should say, to do really well, really efficiently. Uh, Mary? We both have a lot of passion around this, and I think it was really a way for us as partners to be working together to solidify these ideas. So it really was just a, a great experience to take what we've learned um, together with other teams and pull it together. And at this point, being able to provide something to the community and get feedback. Uh, one of the things we want to do with the website is to continue the conversation. The book is not the end all. We expect it to evolve over time also. So we're just excited to be able to share this and um, hopefully our readers will find ways to continue the conversation with us. Absolutely. We will make full details of the book and the website available with this podcast via the IEEE software website so that our readers can follow it up as extensively and uh, as thoroughly as possible. Any final comments on where Agile is going and how it's, how it's changing requirements practices? What are we going to see that's different in the future from all of those practitioners who have adopted your practices? Well, I think, I think what we will stop talking about Agile and Lean also as sort of a hype thing. I think what's going to happen is it's going to go the way of object orientation that this is going to be the way that we do development. And, and deliver products because it just doesn't make sense. The risks are so high that using these Agile Lean practices just are going to be common sense. I think that's one thing that we'll see happening in the, in the future. And the, the second thing that I'll turn over to Mary that I think is going to happen is that people are going to continue to challenge uh, traditional specifications as the way to try to communicate requirements and um, put more and more emphasis on these collaborative techniques um, and go more lightweight rather than big, big specs. How about you, Mary? The ability for people to be able to effectively collaborate is going to require folks to focus on some of the soft skills and the team dynamics and the partnership aspect. I think is just going to have to be addressed in many more engaging ways. And we're hoping the book will be a stepping stone there uh, for that. But it will also require some folks to be able to communicate. Um, just quickly, a client we worked with recently, uh, the CIO came into the show and tell that we had. And he basically turned to the developers and said, you guys need to improve your communication skills and working directly with the business. And so that to me is its true today. It's going to be true in the future. I do see that using some of these frameworks will enable that. Fascinating. Well, Ellen Gostina, Mary Gorman, this has been a delightful way to spend a cold winter's afternoon. Um, thank <laughs> you very much for your time. And I am no doubt we will receive lots of enthusiastic feedback on this fascinating podcast. So on behalf of IEEE Software, thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to SC Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To support us, you can advertise SE Radio by clicking the Dig, Reddit, Delicious, or Slash dot buttons on the site, or by talking about us on Facebook, Twitter, or your own blog. If you have feedback specific to an episode, please use the commenting feature on the site so that other listeners can respond to your comments as well. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Thanks again for your support.